français euh, n'est pas très bon. Euh, alors, euh, je vais parler en, en anglais. En fait, I, I used to speak fr better French when I was younger because I am from Canada and they do not in us with French as we are a bilingual country, but I live in the English part of it. They say, you know, if you don't lose it, if you don't use it, you lose it. I definitely fit into that category. I was able to understand like a good 70, 80% of the previous presentation though. I was impressed with myself. Um, so, but I'm going to be talking uh, today um, about a, a project which I lead at Red Hat. Uh, it's called the URI Project. It is based uh, in GWT, uh, which is what you just learned about in the previous talk. So this kind of is a nice dovetail into it. Um, but why make a new framework? Well, that's because that's because that's what we do, right, at, at, at JBoss and, and Red Hat. Um, so, you know, we, we make frameworks in the middleware division, and uh, we attempt to make life easier for people by doing so. You know, frameworks about abstractions. Abstractions are good. You know, you can you can build on you can build new ideas and existing good ideas. But really, um, Polyglot today has got some problems. Uh, these Polyglot web apps. Now, poly when I say Polyglot, has got problems. I, I don't want to say. Uh, I don't want to come off as this like pro Java bigot that's like anti JavaScript, anti Ruby. Um, I'm actually quite a, a fan of Ruby and Python. Actually, I learned object oriented programming on Python, so I'm a fan of the language. A long, long time ago, in the 90s, actually. Um, long before most people even knew what polyglot was. I mean, pylon, what was Pylon. Python. Yes. Java. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know. But you know, it, it's a problem if you want type safety, like you know, polyglot application. When I say polyglot application, I mean an application which is literally made of multiple languages. So you, you know, part of the application lives in, in JavaScript, and part of the application lives in Java or Ruby. And of course, we have things like REST, which allows to abstract these things and have like common interfaces for this. But I mean, there's there's a downside to that, right? I mean, you know, and a lot of people they they want they, they you know they you know will say that type safety gets in your way. Um, I, you know, I, I say some people need it. You know, this, 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 you know, but, but I love JavaScript. Some people say, well, I like factoring. This is the classic argument that people have, um, and they say Java sucks inevitably, and, and I, I reply with this. <laughs> um, but you know, boilerplate sucks, right? And one of the nice things about strong typing is that we can actually use, you know, types to eliminate a lot of boilerplate. Because you know we can infer things about the structure of the application using type information, and that's exactly what we do in a framework like this. So, monoblock, right? You know, single single language. Um, I like to now explain a ride to people using a competitive framework, Node.js, uh, which some of you are likely familiar with, which is uh, an uh, application platform, which is based on the V8 JavaScript engine, uh, and allows you to write code in the server, which is written in JavaScript, and share that kind of code across the client and the server using cool things like socket IO and stuff. And so you have a nice single application that's distributed across the client and the server, uh, and, it, and it runs uh, all in JavaScript on the server and the client. Well, Roy takes the same general idea but moves in a different direction. Normally we thought of Java as running only on the server, well, we're now running Java in the client. And we're doing that using GWT, as was explained in the last talk. Now, Orion takes it a little bit further, because, and um, actually, I, I, should, I should stay on this slide, because I have done. Um, Orion takes it a little bit further, um, in the sense that GWT is really cool in how it's able to take you know, and, you know, this Java code translated to JavaScript. But what would be really awesome is if we could do that but still have the same sort of advantages that we get when we use frameworks on the server side. You know, we have things like JPA, which abstracts away, you know, a lot of the work that we'd have to do to get things in and out of a relational database. And we even have, uh, you know, hybrid OGM now today, which uh, Emmanuel Bernard, uh, who is uh, another French person from France, <laughs> who, who, who lives up in Paris, actually, um, who, who created Hibernate OGM, and that can now actually, uh, you know, map Java entities to and from uh, NoSQL, 
based databases. And so, I mean, and those, and those things those things allow us to, to do lots of cool things, and so we build on that. But we are in the middle of a rich client revolution, which is kind of, I think, the theme that was being touched on a bit in the last presentation as well. Um, we're seeing more and more people want code to run inside their browser, as opposed to on the server. Learn our browsers to do more things. The browser is actually a really cool application platform. It has, today with HTML5, it has offline storage, it has, uh, you know, it has 3D rendering and things like WebGL. Uh, so we can do really, really awesome stuff in the browser that no one would have ever thought of doing before. I mean, six, seven, eight years ago, it was just like, you know, more of the templating frameworks, you know, how can we template HTML and make our applications dynamic that way. It's no longer that. Uh, we're now taking advantage of these powerful JavaScript engines and we're, we're mutating state in the browser um, using that. And GWT, of course, is, is a way to that. So we take HTML, Java, and GWT, and we come up with a rhyme. And so uh, what, we also take this, uh, we also take uh, some ingredients from another place, which is actually kind of an, a, a, a weird place to take it from, um, and that's Java EE. A lot of people recoil at Java EE today. A lot of people are Spring users and um, you know Wicket users, and they've just very much been turned off by Java EE um, back because you know EJB did used to suck, and lots of Java EE APIs did used to suck. I, I I actually was one of those people when I joined Red Hat. I I was about as anti EE as you could possibly get. Um, I lived completely outside the Java EE ecosystem, um, but I think I think that it is a it's a set of APIs that have redeemed themselves. Um, they've kind of grown up and they now live in a more more POJO world, which is sort of where the world was going in spite of it years ago. Um, and I actually think that there's actually something here um, that we're able to use and bring to the client. I'm going to show you some of that today. Um, but I want to go through like a, you know, a bit of a primer here. This is actually kind of re repeating a lot of, of what was said in the last framework. So I'm not going to go through these are in the last talk. So I'm not going to repeat all these arguments. But some of them are some of these are interesting though. I mean, the third one, you know, GWT is not a monolithic framework. This is probably the most important thing to understand and 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 to understand that something like Array can actually exist. GWT really creates like the the ability to create ecosystems in the browser, just like Java creates ecosystems in the server. You know, the fact that we're translating code, um, you know, doesn't mean that through code through GWT doesn't mean that we actually have to use GWT the way that you know GWT comes. We can we can build on top of that. In fact, Array replaces most of GWT, see, with, with the exception of the compiler. So all, a lot of the stuff that we just heard about, things like Request Factory and, um, and the JPA support and stuff, we're actually going to do away with all of that, and we're going to start from scratch. So that's, 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 that's a little bit uh, disconcerting, but, um, you know, so we're going to so go ahead and into this, in this presentation. I'm going to be doing some demo, I like demo-oriented talks. And here, uh, we're going to talk about something called CDI. How many people here are familiar with CDI, Context of Dependency Injection? Okay, so for those who aren't, um, I'm sure that you guys have, uh, have, have probably heard of Salon, the, uh, the, the language which Stefan works on over here. You may have given a talk here at some point. Have you not? A year ago, but not that many of them were there. Well, uh, Gavin King, uh, the creator of this, of this new language, uh, who also created Hibernate, by the way, with Hibernate, you're probably familiar with Gavin, at least indirectly, uh, was also responsible for leading the specification called CDI, which is uh, uh, basically a standardized way of doing dependency injection and managing application contexts inside Java Enterprise applications. So we're going to we're going to take a look at that, and we're also going to take a look at some JPA stuff and other fun stuff. And so, for those people who aren't familiar with JPA, you know this this is this is this is like you know um, part of the annotation which which you see the most when using JP, I mean CDI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, the, you know, if, if you haven't, how many people here, have, you, 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 everyone here has worked with some amount of dependency injection before, right? Like Spring, Spring Framework, Juice, stuff like that. Everyone knows what that is. So what, what Arai has really done is bring this capability right into the browser and quit. So our CDI experience that we have on our server, the ability to wire together to discover them through class path scanning and figure out how to wire everything together in the container and then do it up 
all automatically is something that we bring to the client. So um, I, I'm now being instructed by my slide to open my IDE and show you something. Okay. Um, let's take a look at this. I actually like that the I, I, I actually like the fact that that quit presentation came before me because it actually allows me to get more into the meat of a right off the bat without having to explain too much about what quit is and how it works. So I've created a, I, 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 like, I like to do my presentations this way because you know one of the ways you can really like understand something or grok something if you're a programmer is actually to see someone do it. I haven't actually created a pre canned demo. I didn't write any code on the plane. I didn't write any code this morning. This is a blank project. There is no code here. Um, so I'm gonna start from scratch. I'm gonna build an application with you today and show you kind of how you can leverage Orion and Gwit to, to build really cool applications using all those ingredients we talked about before. So I'm gonna, I, I'm, if everyone can see that, I, 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 raise your hand if you can't see the, the text on the screen at the current font size. Okay, good, all right. So I'm just gonna create a new class. Uh, I'm gonna, and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna call it, call it app. I'm, I can call it whatever I want. This is, this, uh, this, it's just, th that just came into my head now. And I'm going to do what I would do in, CD, in CDI on the server. And we'll show you some CDI on the server. So you can see that this is a Java X Enterprise context application scoped B. And that, what that basically means is that it's a singleton in this, for the actual um, life of the application. That's, if, that's, that's what that basically means. And so I basically told, I, I'm basically saying that I, I want this bean, which is called app, to be instantiated. And well, let's, let's do something interesting with it. Actually, as well. So let's make this private just for fun, just to see how it works. And I'll create a thing called, you know, hello. A method here called hello. And that, that, that's that. So let me, let me show you what that does. And then we'll explain what I just did. So I'm starting up with, you know, the same way that this, the same way that we saw before, slightly different IDE, but we we just basically created a, a, a GWT application in Arai. Um, that instantiated that thing for us, it ran that method. Um, and it did that because we, we told it to do that uh, with that post construct annotation, which as you can see is once again is a standard Java EE API. Um, so what this what this application what this application was uh, did was was first thing it did was it scanned at compile time for all of the beans. In this case we're only one. It found this bean, realized its application scope, so it should be instantiated when the when the application loads, and so there's a post construct on it, and it's like, hey, I gotta call that post construct right after I construct it. And we can we can we can we can do even more things. If, if <coughs> this is just to show you here how this how cool this actually is. I'll go here and I'll create another bean. I'll call it foo. I won't give it a scope, and by not giving a scope, it, it's going to be it's going to be part of what's called the dependent scope, meaning that whatever injects it will inherit the scope of whatever it's injected into. Um, let's just you know, go in here. Give give it a name. And like so. Now that I have that, now that I have that new class over here, I'll go over here and I'll inject foo into here, like so, and then I'll say, oops, hello foo, oops, not get name. So, probably know what's going to happen there, but I'll, I'll show it anyways. Um, so, so now the application is, you know, the application started up and, and it, it loaded the bean again, and it injected this foo instance. It created a new one. Uh, so, in fact, because it's dependent, just to explain that a little bit more, because I'm kind of teaching CDI at the same time that I'm teaching Arai. Because it's dependent, if I had another, uh, if I had, had another uh, bean called app two and it injected foo, they would they wouldn't share an instance because they're dependent. They each get their own version of foo. Um, Unless, unless I gave it, let's like, say, an application scoped, and then I would get the same one injected wherever I injected it. But so this is this is running in the browser. This is getting compiled down to JavaScript, um, and is running and is running in the browser just like you would expect that. So like, what? So what can we do with that? How can 
how can we kind of evolve this a little bit more? So um, I said that I, can, I made the comparison to Node.js earlier uh, while, I was, while I was showing you this stuff. Um, so let's go ahead and, and, and create a server-side CDIB. I've got this nice little folder here called server. The application's nice and like laid out for me here. And I'll go here and I'll create it. I'll call it uh, server beam. Because that will make it quite obvious. And I'll do this, and I'll do the same thing I did on I'll, I'll do the same thing I did on the on the the client side. I'm gonna give it an application scope. So the application server will instantiate it. And it will live for the duration of the application deployment. And I'm gonna do something that I'm going to take advantage of a CDI feature uh, known as uh, uh, the type safe events. And these type safe events are essentially just POJO objects. So we can define a type and I can, I can call, oh, let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> why, 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 why explain it ahead of time when I can just show you and explain it at the same time? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to create a new type here. I'm going to call it hello. And this, this is going to be my event type. And I put this little annotation on it called portable. Now this is one of our annotations. This is the first time we've actually seen an array API here in the import here, or in array. What this basically means is that, that we, we want to tell array that this, this type should be portable across the client and the server. I want you to be able to marshal it or serialize it so we can, so we can move this type all over the place throughout the application. That's exactly what it will do. In fact, um, let's, let's, let's do something interesting here. Let's put, let's put the long in here that contains the time and string, the name. Uh, now notice I did, now notice I did something crazy here though. I'm creating I'm creating a marshallable bean. Um, but I have a pub, I have a public I don't have a no R constructor on here. In fact I'm gonna make this final. This is this is even crazy. There's gonna be no setters on this. This is gonna be really really crazily immutable. Um, and we can actually do that. We can actually uh, create types like this in RI, uh, using this nice maps to annotation. And so what I'm what I'm basically saying here, I like to, I like to show this whenever I because I'm, I'm a big fan of immutability in applications. I think it's I think it's uh, one of the best ways to avoid bugs. Um, as I'm telling RI that it can it can marshal this application by calling this constructor. And what maps to here says is like, hey, this parameter of the constructor maps to field time, and the parameter, this parameter name maps to the field name. And that way Arai can figure out how to construct and deconstruct the object now. And so let's go here and, and let's modify <coughs> this to do something we do. I'm going to inject another CDI API. Um, Java X enterprise event dot event. And I'm going to give it a type parameter. <coughs> and that type parameter is going to be that hello that I just created, because that's going to be my event type. And so now the so, so what, what this will do now, this is which is a little bit different than say injecting something like foo, it's going to inject a essentially like a, a proxy object uh, that will know how to handle the firing of the event hello. And I'll create one of those events in my post construct this time. So I'm going to go hello event dot fire new hello. And of course, what's nice about this now is that I don't have a default no R constructor on. This is the great thing about immutable types. Like I actually have to give it some valid values. And it forced me to do that. So I'm going to, to do this. And I'm going to give it a name. And I'm going to call it, no, we'll, we'll give it the name from Fufu that we created there. Foo can give us the name. And so we have hello world fire. The current the, 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 the current time millis from the client actually. So, so that's the cool thing about Gwit, right? I mean Gwit has this JRE emulation library that emulates a lot of the Java APIs that you're familiar with. And so this that would actually map in JavaScript to the uh, API in JavaScript that returns the Unix epoch time. And that's and that's the actual value that will get, get passed there. And so if we go to the server beam now and I create this, this method here called observes hello. I'm going to, that was what I wanted to do. Um, I'm going to print out uh, in my console here on the server, received hello. And we can just uh, print out you know, hello get time and then <coughs> hello.get 
name. Like so, really simple. But what, so, but what's cool about what I just did was that I've now basically created a way of, of sending data to the server completely asynchronously. And I, what I haven't done is I haven't like defined a RESTful endpoint. I haven't done anything like that. In fact, I've created an application which is capable of talking to the server now. And so let's, I'm gonna go ahead and shut down my server here again. I'm gonna go ahead and re, I'm gonna go ahead and restart this application. And we'll take a look at this console log and we'll see what happens when the application loads. So the application's gonna load up here. But look at that. So um, that, that, that was the, that message that we just sent from the, the client um, from the client to the server um, by firing that type safe event. And, and so, I mean, that, that's, 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 that's kind of cool. We can take it to the next level, right? Because it turns out that, like I said, you know, these are nice shared APIs. They work on the client and the server, but it can work in reverse. So it's really fun. You can send these messages back to the client completely asynchronously, whenever you want, however you want. And so if we go back to our back to our client code here, so here's where we create this event. I'm gonna go here and head it and create um, a, new, a new event type. I'm just gonna call it response. Or actually, let's not call it response. Let's be more eventy. Let's call it uh, server time, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to get because we want the server, we want the server to tell us what time it is. And let's use a, a more complex type to show up in marshalling this time. Let's use a uh, let's do Java util date. Like so let's create a constructor for that. And of course, I want it to be portable again because I want I want a ride to be able to marshal it. In in in, in marshaling uses a JSON marshaling format. So what will happen is when it gets transmitted from the server, the actual object will get turned into a JSON data structure, and then on the client, it gets it gets uh, read back in from from JSON that way. So we'll, we'll go ahead and map that in there. So now, in like in response to sending this the uh, receiving this hello event, let's let's. Let's just for, for fun create a, a chain of events that happens across the client and the server, and I'll do that by injecting one of those uh, event firing thingies into, in, into the server being this time. And once again, this is the exact same API we used in the client. Um, there's something to be said for, for consistency. So after it receives its event, it's going to fire um, new server time event. And just construct a new date there, which, oops, which by default should contain the current time. And we go back into our client here, and we'll create an observer method. So we go observes time from the server. Let's do one of those alerts again, which is like a, a browser, um, and we'll get, oops, time dot, <laughs> I'm observing the wrong type, yes, thank you. I'm very jet lagged from my uh, flight yesterday, so thank you for um, time to string, yes, okay, there we go. So let's, 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 let's restart this application one more time, and, and uh, hopefully we should, uh, we should see some magic. Now, we're actually working with J, the people at Zero Turnaround right now on JRebel, so what we'll, because you saw me before, I made modifications to my client code. I made, I made modifications to my client code and just, just refreshed the browser and those changes took effect immediately. I've made some server code changes and unfortunately right now it requires a server restart for those server changes to take effect, but we will soon have some nice JRebel support so you'll be able to just modify code on the server and just like refresh, refresh, refresh. And go for this, um, this restart round trip. Now apparently, um, oh, I, I observed, I didn't, I observed, uh, I was supposed to observe server time. So time.getDate.toString, all right, there we go. Let's see, the jet lag. So let's refresh that again, and I still didn't get anything. Did I send it? 
server time, server time. Let me just do one more refresh here. I did that wrong. I did that very, very wrong. Why does it keep doing this? So I'm, I'm actually using a uh, unstable version of my IDE. My IDE keeps trying to open my browser to port negative one. Um, that's not supposed to happen. But there we go, actually. That, 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 that was what was supposed to happen. So, so we fired this, we just fired an event to the server, and the server fired another event, and we observed it in the client. And now you can see that we were able to um, see what the current time on the server is. But this is completely asynchronous, right? I mean, I, I, could, I could have fired that date event, I mean, that, that server time event at any time during the application. Like, I could have been in the middle of, like, entering a form in my application. This is, like, going to pop up into the blue. Hey, the server wants to tell you what the current time is. And, and then, of course, you'd know, because you'd have a pop-up with the current time. And, but, you know, it, it, it's fun, it's, it's fun to, to demo that. Um, to demo, how, like, you know, how asynchronous it is. I like to write, like, really, like, ridiculous code in demos that I would that you would never write in real life. And I'm going to do that right now because like why not, right? <coughs> so um, let's go here, let's go ahead here and create a, a thread. Oops. You know how they tell you not to, not to spawn threads in app servers? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. So um, let, let's go ahead here and an override run and we'll let's say Let's go wild true, and and let's let's make it even really badly. Let's make it really badly behaved. If 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 we get an interrupted exception, we don't care. We don't, we don't care. Whatever. And so, um, we like you want to interrupt me. I I'm gonna keep going. That's, that's what I want to do. And so I'm I'm, I'm gonna sleep for 100 milliseconds on every on every iteration here. And then, and then I'm going to fire one of these events. I'm going to fire like 10 of these a second. Um, but I don't, <coughs> don't want to have to hit OK 10 times a second with the current pop-up. So let's, let's go ahead and, and try something else here. I'm going to inject uh, a root panel object here. And on post construct, well actually let's go private, label, uh, late. So let's, let's, make it, let's make it final. So I, I, I mentioned earlier that I like immutability, and so I'll, I'll create a, a time label. It's actually a server time label, but I want to be really descriptive. Um, let's add that to the root panel, like so. And then when we observe the time, we'll just set the actual state from the label, um, from the time to string. Now, that might not be as interesting as it could be, so because it's it's only going to show um, it's going to show the formatted date. And that's not going to have milliseconds, so we're not really going to get to see the full effect of this. But oh well, uh, we'll see the seconds change. Believe me, it will be it will be receiving ten per second. <coughs> um, let's start this up again. Does it get the uh, refresh of the code directly? It have to restart the project every time when I make server changes. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, no, the client side's fine. You make the client side change, you can just refresh, um, and that will work. As I said, we're working on a JRebel plugin that will that will fix the, 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 the problem with the, oh, you know what, That why that didn't work? Because I didn't start that thread. I defined it, and then I was like, hey, hey, hey. That's right, start. Let's see if it'll actually do a graceful reset. Start, restart, restart. See, I don't, there we go. What, well, actually, it's receiving a whole, it's receiving a whole bunch of new objects and with, their, with, their, with their hash codes. That's not fun. Well, let's, let's go ahead and, and fix that. Um, it should be time dot, uh, get date dot to string. Now, actually, because this, one of the bad things about that code is when I rest refresh this again, it's actually going to spawn a second thread. So I'll actually be observing, we're going to see a really awesome effect here. Alright, so, well, but, well, so we're actually receiving like what, 20, 20 a second now? But you can see it's actually, it, it's, still, it, it's, it's still receiving and updating. So it's like happening completely asynchronously. Um, I didn't have to worry about doing any like, you know, setting up any interesting long polling or anything like that. Um, I just 
began observing this. And, and, and so like, what Arai does, right, I mean, it, it fundamentally, just like GWT, um, Arai is a compile time process. So we went and we analyzed the code. We noticed that you, it actually noticed that you had a portable uh, type there, and it saw that you had an event observer in your client code. And it actually figured this all out, and it set up a it set up a, a method, an eventing route in our message bus system, which you get for free when you use an array application. And so, in the back end, it's actually receiving a, a heck of a lot of events. But I'm going to go look at what it's doing actually on the wire, because you can see the actual long polling happening if we uh, find the actual. Where's the network screen here with all the events? Maybe I have to use. Uh, um, no messages, messages. No. I don't think I have um, Firebug installed. I thought there was still a more. Oh well, I, I can't apparently see the actual traffic. I thought I could with the default uh, debugging tools in Firefox. Does anyone know how to, how, to, how to see the traffic in Firefox without Firebug? I know how to do it in Firebug. Or you don't use Chrome. Oh, <laughs> I could. I could use Chrome. Um, but I don't know if I have that set up. Um, this is a brand new laptop, and so like I only got it like all set up like recently. So I don't have like everything on here that I used to. I haven't installed Firebug. So um, your Safari, you have the same uh, inspector yeah. behind it's the WebKit uh, behind Safari. Oops. Yeah. I don't want to. I'll, I'll come back to that one. There'll be another. There'll be another. I'll, I'll use Chrome and or something in, or Safari in the next uh, run around, and we can take a look at that. We can take a look at the traffic that time, um, but I wanted—I don't want to get too drawn down on my own technical issues in my presentation here. Um, so it was cool. <coughs> um, what we just saw, just so you know, take a note. That was cool. Um, so the so the so the other um, thing to talk about is UI. Now I showed you the same um, UI APIs that, that you saw in the last presentation, and thought a lot about this problem interface with GWT. Now, the nice thing about GWT is that there's actually lots of different ways to, to build UIs with GWT. Um, you can use jQuery uh, even. Like I know some people have made, made jQuery mobile applications with GWT using its JSNI, uh, its JSNI interface, which is the JavaScript native interface, that you actually wrap Java code around JavaScript code but there was this whole other class of users that we kept talking to um, that were like, look, we have designers that use Dreamweaver, and they make their interfaces for us, and we're used to just taking those, those HTML files and, te and temp putting templates around them, because we don't want to do the design. And Lincoln Baxter, uh, who is the project lead of Forge, and also part-time contributor to Arai, had a crazy idea um, to try and bring this idea of, of uh, kind of what, what jQuery does um, by mutating uh, the actual DOM. And also the, the, the kind of the, what we used to think about is like, you know, uh, in the previous way of doing applications, things like JSF, taking uh, templates and then binding code to those templates with, with expressions. Uh, and bring those together and do it all in the browser. So we came up with this, this new module. And this is new, by the way, for Arai 2.1. Uh, we just shipped our first version of this called Arai UI. And it's actually, it's, it's actually um, quite, quite an interesting way to do it. It won't be for everyone. I mean, some people really like the programmatic swing like UI of, of, of Quit. And, you know, completely free to keep using that. Uh, if, if you like to design applications that way, if you feel you can structure them more effectively that way. Um, but, but we also have another approach here. If you work in a large organization where you have designers and stuff and you want them to be able to, 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 to do that stuff. Um, so it works using pure HTML templates. Uh, and I mean that literally. I don't mean that like 
uh, we have some sort of, it, it's like a velocity or a free marker template and you put like expressions into it. I mean like they're literally HTML5, like you can put them into an HTML5 validator and it will be completely fine with everything in there. But they are templates, believe it or not. Um, and so we take them and we mix them with Java, not, not, not in them, but we, we back end them with Java and then we use some little bit of a CDI to make that all work together. Now I have to open my IDE again <coughs> and show a raw UI. So um, I, like, I like these demo oriented talks. Um, I, I, I really feel people can rock things better like this. So let's take this existing application and add some raw UI, why don't we? So um, I'm just going to create another class. I'm going to call it, I don't know, a, a niece. Why not? I'm, uh, the, the jet lag makes you very creative. And so what I want to do is I want to, I want to create like an object that will represent the template to the Java world and, and you know, in a type safe way. And I'm going to do that by, by indicating this is a templated class, like so. And I'm just going to go ahead and create an HTML file. Now, one of the cool things they did in HTML5 um, was they realized that fragments of HTML would be really useful as opposed to sort of like a full document with a doc type header and like you know, like you know, it has to have a head tag and a body tag and all that other stuff. Um, and they created, they changed the spec to say, well, you can have fragments. And so we take advantage of the fact that you can have completely valid HTML fragments, and we use that for creating, uh, you know, small <coughs> templatelets in pure HTML uh, that we can then composite into to more complex stuff. So I'm just going to go here. And I'm going to create my HTML templates. These are regular divs. Like this, this, this will be rendered in the DOM, right? It's not. It's it, when I when I when I say it's a template. What I really mean is that this is this is actually going to get rendered directly in the application, as is, and a raw UI is going to mutate on elements of that based on what I'm about to show you. So I have a div tag here, and I'm going to go ahead and, and say, create a thing called data field, and I'll call it, I don't know, ABC for fun. Now, HTML5 has this interesting property that any attribute of any element that starts with data followed by dash is a custom attribute that is part that is valid HTML. Uh, so even though even though that doesn't actually show up anywhere in the HTML spec, that data field that is anything which starts with data minus is, is fine. So if I if I put that in W3C uh, HTML5 validator, be like, yeah, that's fine. Whatever data field. Um, so we defined. Actually, we, 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 we decided that we were going to create our own custom attribute, taking advantage of that property of HTML5, and uh, create a way to name DOM elements in our, in our template. In this case, I called it ABC. Now, by default, <coughs> actually, I called this app.html, I meant to call it food.html. Let me correct that mistake quickly. Because I, I called food, a, uh, no, uh, nice, nice HTML. Wow. All right, um, so, I, so now I have nice.html and nice, or nice, nice. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is, it's actually going better than, I, than, 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 one, than one might hope, uh, considering how tired I am. Um, and I'm going to um, in, go ahead and inject a data field, ABC, and in this particular case, well, no, no I, don't, I don't want to, hold on. This isn't my, I, I, I'm actually not the one who um, did this framework, but hold, actually this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. So you can, so what you can do is, I mean, you can actually push or pull to this, to this, to, to the template. Um, if I inject uh, a data field, what I'm doing is I'm actually pulling in the DOM element into my Java code and then manipulating it. In this particular case, I'm creating my element in code 
and then injecting it into the template. So I'm actually going to overwrite that DOM element. Um, so if I go here and go uh, here, close construct, private void on build uh, label dot set text. Hello, French. Actually, let's uh, make it not do that anymore for now. Go back to my app here. And then, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject Nice into here. I, did, I forgot to do one special thing. I forgot to actually make this a widget itself. So I'm actually going to make this a composite. What a composite is, is it's, uh, if you're familiar with Swing, this will make sense to you. But it's basically, uh, uh, a widget which is made up of, of many widgets. And so it's a complex widget as opposed to like a primitive widget. And I'm just going to go to my app here and check that. And then I'm going to go ahead and add that to my root panel again. So what's really going to happen is I'm now going to take this template, which is backed by this Java, um, and I'm going to inject it into my, my application. It won't be anything special. It will look as if I had just injected a a regular label, but we'll modify it and we'll see how we can kind of take advantage of that. Um, let's do this. So there we go. There's that. There's that. There's that label. But but now it's it's actually a pure HTML template. So it's like if if my designer had designed this for me, I could actually do crazy things. Like I could make the style, uh, font size, like uh, I don't know, 64 px. And the, co and the color red. Um, now, if we go back and refresh that, look at that. So, so this, so it, so this is actually like I, I'm now i now created this like you know true binding uh, between like the Java code and the HTML code. Now you can immediately start to think, well, if, if this had been if this had been some sort of mock-up that my designer had made for me in Dreamweaver, we can then start going in and start adding these data fields and then binding that back into our code. So we so like I said before, this goes this goes both ways. So I can create like a button uh, and give it the title of um, hello there. Um, actually I, I don't think I think it's actually I think we're actually just do it like this. Let's go ahead and give that a data field of button. So I said I could go both ways. Like I can actually inject into the template, which is actually kind of cool. One of the reasons why we gave, we added this ability to inject into the template is that the way that injection works in a raw UI is we actually overwrite the DOM at the point that you're injecting to. Which so you you know inside that you're you're th this actually has the interesting property of allowing you to basically like you know work around mockup code. So you might actually have some mockup code in here. Um, that, that mock-ups like what it might look like when it was actually running. But all of that will get replaced at, the data, at, at that data element. And so you can actually do very little work to liven up uh, a, a mock-up HTML. But we can, actually, we can actually take an existing button and not override it, but actually bring it into our template. And we can do that this time by instead of defining it like so, we can actually inject the data field button. And it's smart enough that it will know how to map to the default quit button type. And so we inject it like so, and then we can do something even we we can do something even even cool. We can go ahead here. We can go and define an event handler method for button, and I'll call it on button click click event. So window alert, you clicked the button. So we, we've now we've now defined we've now defined like how, you know uh, so how how we want to actually handle the actual button click in in Java code. Start that up. There's that negative one problem again. It's a that's actually a bug in the the GWT plugin of IntelliJ. Here that it sometimes does, and I think it's probably a thread right 
So we, we start that up, and there's the hello, hello there button. And I click that, and there we go. My, my, my event handler code bound, uh, bound itself to that button and that template that we just defined. And so this, this is a raw UI. I mean, you know, you can, you can go and get much more complicated, but I want to, you know, I want to go through some other things before I, I, I wrap up the talk today. And I also want to have time for questions. Um, but, you know, you could imagine how we can build out from there. And so, and so like that, what, what, what's, what's kind of interesting to, to think about here is the fact that, like I said, that this is, this is a fragment, right? So if I actually were to go ahead and say, um, let's, let's say, <clears throat> do something interesting here, just to demonstrate the, how this is actually working. Instead of injecting niece, I'm going to inject in this instance type of niece. <coughs> and I'm going to inject niece.get, add niece.get twice. And what I expect to see happen here now is to see like my template, oops. What, what, what instance does, I don't understand, what have, what have I done wrong? No, man, oh. All right, I'll, I'll explain why I had to do that in a second, actually. It wasn't a bug, it was me not doing something that I had to do. Let's start that up again, there we go. So we see, so I injected it twice. What I actually did there is instance is a, a type of CDI that essentially lets us, uh, it, it's kind of a type safe way to access the being manager. Uh, and so by doing that and then calling get on that instance twice, it instantiated, instantiated that, that niece class twice. And so doing it, it actually cre it created two, two versions of the template. And I added it to the root panel twice. And so we, we, see, we see the <coughs> instances reflected there. And so you, know, you, can, you can sort of imagine how you can create a lot of these different types of templates, like for example, like a pop-up box template that only has the pop-up box code, and you can add that to the template, and you could remove it from the template. Um, and what's, what, 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 what's more is that because CDI has lifecycle management, we can, actually, uh, we, we can actually clean up the DOM for you automatically when we destroy the beam. Uh, so, we go here and say, come back to our niece here. I can actually say, uh, I can create a pre-destroy method here. What pre-destroy is, is pre-destroy is a is is a is a other part of CDI. A me the pre-destroy method is kind of like a finalizer for garbage collection, which you should never use, by the way. It's okay to use pre-destroy, but never use finalizers uh, because they destroy garbage collection performance. Um, but in this particular case, when we destroy this beam, when we tell the beam manager, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. I want it to be removed. I want to, I want it removed from the DOM. And so I can what I, what I can actually do is I can just create the the you know remove. On, I can create a method here called remove on destroy. Um, so it's obvious what it does. And let's inject the root panel into this, so we have a reference to it, and it will just go panel that remove this. Remove myself when I'm destroyed. I mean, we don't do this for you automatically. Um, there's, 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 we originally thought about doing that, but there's, there's, there's reasons as to why we didn't imply that behavior. Um, although I guess we could create an annotation in the future if we really wanted to automate that behavior. What was dependent for? Oh, okay, so I, I just, I, I'm sorry I skipped over that. Um, I, I had to add dependent because we have a small difference from the way that CDI works in the client that I didn't yet explain. That in order to make the code size that we generate at runtime same, we need to explicitly explain to Arise code generators what beans should be be able, should be able to dynamically look up. Now, because we stopped injecting it directly and then looked it up dynamically, what happened was, Arai was like, well, I, 
you know, you, you're not using it directly, you're using it indirectly, and because of that, I'm not gonna actually generate this extra code that I would, that, that I would use for dynamic lookup at, at compile time. And so what I did, when I added dependent there, which is a CDI annotation, I gave it an explicit scope. And because I gave it an explicit scope as opposed to an implicit scope, Arai was like, okay, I'll make it available for dynamic lookup at runtime. And that wasn't the error I had in there. Arai was like, I don't, I, you know, I don't see this type for, for dynamic lookup. And so that's a bit of a compromise. You don't have to do that with CDI on the server, but if we didn't do that, we would literally have to like defensively add like millions of, or hundreds of thousands of classes for dynamic lookup in the client which you need to get like 20 megabyte JavaScript payloads and it would be crazy. And so we, we, we did that to sort of make it with the WIT compiler's job easier for doing dynamic uh, code deletion. And so that's what I did. I said this is a dependent scope, which means the same thing that it meant without it. Like, you, like this, is, this, 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 is a, um, uh, this scope in CDI is, is uh, it, it, it basically is, is what the scope, it's a scope that you get even if you don't specify it. But we're explicitly specifying it and that means something in Arai. And so that's, that's, that's my, my best explanation in, in, in two or three minutes as to why I did that. Um, but going back to, you know, going back to this, uh, you know, I, I created this pre-destroy method, but because it's, it's, it's a managed beam now, the, like the beam manager actually manages its instance, we can actually do something kind of, kind of interesting. Um, if I go here to, to back here. Why don't we make the button that we click here actually just uh, destroy itself. Um, I'll inject the beam manager. The, the client side beam manager. Which is, so, so, so we have this thing called IOC beam manager. And the reason it's called that as opposed to just beam manager like on the server is we don't, we have, this is also a small API difference is that uh, we actually have a, a, a beam manager which has been optimized for being used to the client. And it's also easy, it's just easier to use in general than the server-side uh, CDI beam manager. But what this does is it allows us to go in there and say, hey, you know, I want, I want to look up a specific beam that was instantiated somewhere in the application uh, based on this metadata, or I want to destroy this beam, which is what I want to do. I want to destroy this beam. And so I inject my beam manager and then I'm like, destroy beam this. Simple enough. And, you know, I, I, I could have called panel that removed this in right in the on button click, but you know the point is just to, to show off the fact that you know it cleans itself up. But I don't know why I just shut down the server and let the client side code change it. But so we add two of those to that, and then when I click this, look it goes away. It goes away. And so um, that 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 actual pre-destroy method was called in, in response to me telling the beam manager to destroy that, that instance. And I could, have called, I could have referenced that beam instance from anywhere else in the application and said, hey, beam manager, destroy this. And that, that on pre-destroy, it would have cleaned itself up and removed itself from, from the actual DOM. So that's, that's my spiel on Arai UI. I'll try to make some time for demoing some questions. So the other question that we have is offline. HTML5 adds um, a whole bunch of stuff that makes this question interesting. It has one big feature that makes it interesting though, and that is offline storage uh, uh, or local storage. And for those who are, of you who aren't familiar with it, and those of you um, who are, I apologize if I'm, if I'm giving you redundant information, but essentially, uh, the HTML5 spec requires browsers to give each website five megabytes of storage, like a cookie almost, like it's associated with the client, that, that lets you store um, data that in, in like a local key value store. You can store up to five megabytes of it. And so every single, so, so that, that data is stored on the client, isn't stored on the server, it's stored locally on your hard drive or on your phone. And Every time you go back to that website, the application that runs, or even if it's an offline application which is running off of your local disk, maybe just click the HTML file in your, in your operating system and open it locally, um, can access that data that we've saved before. Um, 
So we thought to ourselves, well, we went and built CDI in the client. We brought this client side application to the, to, to the I mean, server side application <coughs> model to the client. What if we did the same thing with JPA? It's Jonathan Firth, uh, an engineer uh, who also works on the ORI project in Toronto with me, uh, has been working uh, for, for months now uh, on doing exactly that, taking JPA to the client and then taking advantage of this offline data storage capability that, that we have in the browsers and mapping that to the local data store. So we can use, we can inject our entity manager and create entities and map them and then literally save them locally into the browser using this type safe API. Um, so as I said already, it uses HTML5 offline storage uh, in Java once again and uh, GPA all together. And uh, I have to show you that. So, now this one would take a little bit longer uh, to show, to show you from scratch. Um, so I'm going to quit, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not quit, I mean cheat um, a little bit with this one, because I already have a pre-made demo um, for this one. I just think I'm running down the clock right now. I don't really have time to spend <coughs> the next 15 minutes defining entities and such. So. If I'm going to go in here, I'm going to use, this is actually, um, the demo I'm going to show you is actually the demo that uh, we ship with Arai. So when you download like Arai or you, or you, you know, you check out GitHub or whatever you do, this is the one that's, that's already there. Uh, this is our grocery, grocery list demo. And um, <coughs> so we'll walk through this one and we'll, we'll run it as well um, as opposed to, let me close this one off here and minimize this. We might come back. Um, this, this, is, this, this, is, this is already, this actually is a nice tight all together application. As you can see, it's using Arai UI again. So we have, um, you know, we have these Arai UI templates uh, that we were just, that we were just showing you and all these, all these nice crazy stuff. Crazy backing needs. And actually our demo is actually, our, the demo as you can see is really nicely commented and explaining everything that goes on here. So if you actually want to look at this, um, I can give you a GitHub repository. You can you can look at this code that uh, later. Um, but what's interesting about this is let's go here and say where is it? Yes, in the shared directory, we have these entities. Now, this is if you've used JPA before, you, this this code will look eminently familiar to you. Uh, this so this is this is a this is a JPA entity. That's a JPA entity annotation. Uh, we've got an ID with a generated value here, um, and all this other fun stuff. In this particular case, it's just a user with an ID and a name. Um, and here I have another one. Like it's it's a store, uh, has a name, has departments, has all this fun stuff. This has got a one to a one to many relationship on departments. Um, now, believe it or not, we support all of this in the client. Like all the, everything like that you're seeing here. So in complete in complete offline mode. And so I'm gonna show this to you. Let's start this up and, and just take a look at this and we kind of come back to the code. <coughs> um, I'll show you the application. There's that minus one again. I'll probably just why do you do this? So let's start this up, and actually, this is interesting too because if you, you'll probably you're probably noticing if you've used Twitter Bootstrap before, um, this looks a lot like Twitter Bootstrap, and actually it is. So this I uh, I um, mentioned earlier that you can even, that you can use things like Twitter Bootstrap and jQuery with with Arai, with with Wit in this case with Wit and Arai. That's exactly what we're doing here. So this is actually a jQuery based app using Arai UI as well. And it's got all this Java code wrapped around it. And so um, you can see here, actually, this is that I entered those two items on the plane yesterday. Um, and they are actually located in my local data storage. Those did not come down from the server. Um, if I open up my um, web console here, um, I know this will work. 
I'll, I zoom in here and I go uh, window dot local storage, which is the local storage object, and we take a look at this, and the uh, you can see that there is actually the um, oops. storage again dot so we scroll down here you can see there's the uh, the actual data like it, the JSON data those are the, actually those are the keys actually so if we go here and look at at user ID 855 actually I've got to I have to escape all this because that's actually this is that the actual key itself is 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 uh, a, a JSON entity yeah. That will make it. Oops. Get that again. Let's put that into some quotes. There you go. Wait, is that 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 work? It actually should no, It didn't. Now you might not be. <coughs> oh, where, where's that? Just. Uh, Oh, name me. Yes, so that actually that actually is it. So if we go back to the app now and clo close this off here, there. Yeah. So there. So uh, name 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 foo or whatever. So that, that actual data was stored in the in the, lo in the local object store. And what's interesting is that is that you know we actually do basically the same thing that that Hibernate OGM does on on the server side with no SQL. We actually have a nice front end. Uh, Using using JSON data structures that basically map onto a key value store, but you know this this is this is all like working completely offline. In fact, like you know it can actually you know we can take the server completely away, and you know we can still you know add and remove this stuff. In fact, um, the compiled version of this as opposed to the dev mode version. The problem with running it in dev mode is if I take the server away, the dev mode plugin very. Uh, Really helpfully kills the kills the actual browsing experience. But if I actually go into Ride JPA here, um, go to that demo, if we actually compile it down to JavaScript and use the actual native if we go clean install. So I'm talking. So this is going to be like a regular web compile. So it's actually going to create. Uh, the plain HTML and JavaScript products that we could then put onto a server and, and, and run it from. And well, actually, let me do something here. Let me compile it for JBoss 7. Um, so, you know, once it's once it's once it's done that, you know, I'll, what I'll do is we can we can bring this application up. We'll serve it from Java JBoss Application Server 7. And I'll push <coughs> the server away, and you'll actually see how we're able to continue to mutate on that data um, without the server present and, and modify the store modify the actual data store um, using purely JPA like you know yes you, you mentioned that it was using the NoSQL storage on the clients yes I seem to remember that there are two available there is one SQL and one NoSQL so the um, SQL Lite has actually been removed from the HTML5 spec yeah, the one that came in that was originally part of, like originally, like Google Gears had that, yeah. and it was moved in the HTML5 spec. That was actually removed. So, okay. that, so um, I think they're talking about adding something like that in in a future revision of the specification. Feel, did I run out of like? Uh, could not find artifact. Oh, sorry. The the uh, the um the problem is is that uh, I am on the three point branch right now of course and it can't find okay I'm I'm gonna try and do this really really quickly while I try to explain this further we can go back and look at the code here let's speed this up and skip all the tests. Um, so if you like, if, if we, once again, Noam, to, to respond to your question, yeah, I think they might add uh, a, a SQL Lite back into the spec, but it was removed 
Uh, it would have made it a heck of a lot easier to implement this if we had actually been able to target SQLite. But no, we've, we've actually had to basically do the same thing that Emmanuel did with Hibernate OGM. And we, we basically have to have a full, uh, we have to have a full query front end on the actual data store that we, that we do there. And we have to deal with all of the persistence of the, you know, all that using JSON data structure. So, uh, no, that would have been really nice though if they'd kept that around. So, but so, but but currently this is really all compatible. All HTML5 compliant browsers can 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 work with Hibernate UI. We we have like we have different like we actually have the ability to plug in different storage providers if if they do manage to plug that back in. Um, there we go. Hopefully, I can build this now and demo this going completely offline. JPA. Does anyone have any questions while I'm doing this, by the way? Because I might as well maximize my time. Yes? Yes, what happens when you go back uh, online? So if you have modified the local store, and eventually the, the server store has been changed as well? So. Well, I predicted this question would come. <laughs> um, that act, so um, we are currently working on data sync technology uh, for server-side server to client data sync. Um, and what exactly are you talking about? Like losing your network connection, going onto an airplane, say you have like a CRM application that was written in a ride, you have, you've copied a whole bunch of stuff to a local data store using these entities, and you want to be able to modify that stuff, and when you get a network connection back, you want it, you want it to like detect this, and go, hey, I have changes I want to upload. So we are working on that today. Um, that will, that's like going to be one of our main headline features is for, for i 3.0 on our roadmap. Um, it took a long time just to get, you know, the, this working with 2.1, just the offline data store. Um, we, you know, right now it's trivial to actually do it, you can kind of do basic sync yourself, because it's JPA, and you can actually share the entities. So you can use the same entities just like we did before, like we were sharing types between the client and the server for server side and client side. Now, of course, you're going to have to write a little bit of code to move that back and forth and to persist it to local store and then persist it and merge it and then persist it to their store. Um, but we're not doing that for you automatically yet. We, we will. In fact, we're going to have two strategies for doing this that I can talk about uh, in, in, in a few minutes uh, when I talk about kind of what we're, what, we're, what we're currently working on now. So this is just compiling it to permute. Are there any other questions, actually, during, during while well, this is doing its thing? Yeah. Uh, you are using the GWT compiler, right? Right now I am, yes. Um, are you bound to the same limitations about the classes that it is able to translate from Java to JavaScript? So, um, we are bound, so, uh, yes, yeah, so there's, there are, there is a concept of translatable classes, so there's a JRE emulation library, which contains a whole bunch of stuff, all the stuff from java.lang, uh, most of the stuff from java.util uh, and some other various uh, packages. Um, but there, is a there are limitations because you, 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 or GWT does have, to ha does have to be able to fill in uh, some of the, the implementation details for some of these things. Um, we have added a whole bunch of new stuff, of course, that wasn't part of the emulation library, like the CDI APIs, for example. So, we so what we had to do is we had to actually um, create uh, compatibility libraries, and we, and we had to create our own client-side implementation and tell GWT about this. So GWT has this deferred binding framework that lets us do that. So when we see that, you know, uh, that there's that there's like a, a type here, we can actually provide it with an implementation of that type. The other thing we can do is it has, has another concept called super sourcing, and you can create a, a set of like a, your own directory of translatable code that contains all the implementations of the types that you want to be available to the compiler. So you can go and extend and add that stuff that, that you want. Like if you wanted to have your own implementation of time util, like we did, and it wasn't available in, in GWT, you can actually go and do that yourself. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that is what limitation, right? I mean, you, you, there are, uh, you can't just go and use like java.io.input stream. If you have an input stream in your, I'm apparently not on the network anymore. Uh, if you have, a, if you have an, uh, an input stream, GWT's not going to, it's gonna complain. It's gonna be like, I don't know how to, translate this, right? Um, nothing in the Java.io package is, is part of the JRE emulation library. Um, 
not not that it would make sense to really. I mean, you can't open files and stuff in the browser, and, and so um, having those those files translatable would make sense. Uh, but but yes. Um, so I'm going to copy this WAR file here uh, to uh, AS7 deployment directory here. Uh, my WebSockets demo directory. Uh, I see you got a And I just realized why I didn't see those requests coming in, by the way. Now that I think about it. Um, oops. I wanted to move that into deployment. So what am I doing? Yes. Let me remove uh, raw UI demo here. I don't want to use any of these other things to point or by code. Oops. All right, that's that's all I, all I want. All right. What am I doing? All right, all right, so web sockets. Then start this up. So I this so I'm actually uh, deploying a fully quit compiled thing. What happened here? Um, I don't think this is this is it. This is an old. This is an old. I'm using an old version of AS. This is actually a bug. This, what happened? What happened was is in our stuff. Uh, it's because we have CDI on the server. This is an old version. This has actually been patched in a while. The problem is I have like a old development version of of AS7 final snapshot. This bug was actually fixed. It's been trying to instantiate one of our servlets has a bean and it doesn't have a default constructor. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I, 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 either, I, I either have to check quickly to see if I have a, new, I have a newer version of AS that has that, that bug fixed or I'm going to have to get you to take my word for it that uh, JPA works completely offline. Um, we believe you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, I mean, that, that's, so that's, that's JPA for now. Sorry, sorry that, that that demo didn't. I mean, this is this is the danger of doing like live coding demos. This is actually going kind of kind of well, uh, as opposed to having it all pre-canned and all pre to like you know yeah, you always you always run the risk that you're going to crash and burn. Um, but yeah, so data sync is going to be our, our next biggest thing. Um, the ability to, to to take that stuff offline and and. Uh, Modify it and then update it. Now, one of the, so, so what we're doing with that is interesting. We're going to support two methods of data sync. So it does not exist today, but it's under current development. Uh, the ability to just basically you know, do what you would normally think, kind of go up to the server and then download a data set. Um, Jonathan is working on this, has, this has, has an idea of how we're going to be able to create um, essentially uh, snapshot, like result set fragments that represent uh, a set of data that exists in the server and it's mirrored in the local client. And then you can monitor, then what you'll do is you'll actually, if you're online, you'll just interact with those entities locally and they'll get synced up to the server. And if there's conflicts, of course, you'll have to write conflict resolution code. The other thing that we're working on uh, is something called the OTEC engine. And OTEC stands for uh, Operational uh, Transform uh, Eventually Consistent. Uh, so what operationally transformed, eventually consistent means is that in Arrive 3.0, we're going to take this JPA stuff, this offline JPA stuff and the server stuff, and we're actually <coughs> going to monitor in real time uh, by proxying the objects locally in the client and also in the server. And as changes get made, we're going to create operational transform instructions. Now, if you've seen Google Wave before, uh, you know, with like the live editing and stuff, or you've worked on Google Docs collaboratively, it's basically the same idea. So as things change, uh, Arai is going to build, using the OTEC framework, all the changes, like the, the deltas of the numbers 
and the texts and the dates. And it's going to send only that, a journal of these changes across the server asynchronously and back and forth. And each side is going to apply these changes asynchronously. And so it has two components to that. It's oper operational transfer. And the other thing we said was eventually consistent, which basically means unlike traditional uh, databases where <coughs> like, you know, the ACID principle of you know, cons with consistency being what C stands for, uh, we're not going to guarantee that, that, that things are consistent at the same time and every time. We're going to guarantee that they'll be eventually consistent. Um, across across clients and across the servers. Um, now, we don't know what kind of applications people will build with that. Uh, we will have sort of like, you know, the tried, tested, and true approach that of, of, like, of like, you know, dealing with, with syncing of data. But we think one of the cool things that we'll be demoing next year is this OTEC frame, where we'll have two people with JPA entities editing the same record, and as they make changes, will literally be like capturing their keystrokes and sending deltas across. And if two people are looking at the same record, they, they should see the same sort of effect that you see in Google Docs. And you'll get that for free as part of the JPA data sync and, you know, Array Boss and Array UI. This is like really bringing together the stack. And that's like what we're going to be working on over the next six to 12 months. So that's our plan for data sync. I, I can't show you anything functional today, uh, but, but we, I don't, what, how am I for time, by the way? What time is it? 10 plus 10. <laughs> okay, well, um, so I, I, I always, I've been doing this now. I have this, like, like, like the free form thing. Uh, if, if, if no one's interested, uh, then, then, you know, then, then we won't do it. But it's just sort of, this is sort of like, you know, I want you to show me this type section. This is unplanned. So I'm running the risk that you guys are going to put up your hands and, like, tell me something really hard to do. Um, but if there's something that, that you're interested in seeing, like this is like live code, like if you want me to go ahead and do something and show you how to do something that, you know, or, or, more, or more clearly go back back and, and do that, uh, this, is, this, is, this is your opportunity to put up your hand and, and sort of like indicate that you're, you're interested in, in deep diving into something. Kind of like questions, but like rich questions. This is just, just like we have rich clients. So is anyone interested in like, is, is there something that you saw that you wish that I had covered more uh, more carefully or deeply, I think. We all got it. All right. No, any, about, any, any, about any? The, the, yeah, one question. Yeah. The, yeah. When you uh, inject the communication between the client and the server, yeah, it is. Is it? It is it based on the HTML5 or does it fall back on what kind of technology behind the unit? Can you, can you restate the question? So do you use, uh, yeah, to go more straight, it is, does it use WebSocket or? Um okay, so I went into my browser earlier and I was like very confused about why I wasn't seeing any of those requests coming across the <coughs> server. And then it occurred to me why <laughs> at, that, at, that, at that latest moment. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start this, the, our application up again. I'm going to go in back into here, and I'm going to take a, uh, a more careful look at, actually, let me refresh this again. So this is what happened. So we have this like really fun uh, and, and awesome uh, technology, which is a ride bus which is what was powering all that as asynchronous stuff that we saw earlier when we were pushing all the stuff to it. And I was going in there and, gonna, and looking for the long polling requests. But you see, I have the web sockets turned on in, in AriBus, and what, this hap what, what happens is, is that AriBus establishes a long polling session. Um, and then what it tries to do is it tries to see if the server that it's talking to, and indeed itself, if it's running in a browser that's capable of WebSockets, is capable of talking with, uh, is capable of talking WebSockets. And so you can see here, this me message here, um, Aribus uh, connected to the server, and the server said, <coughs> these are the capabilities that I have. This long polling is available, and I also have WebSockets. Well, so what ultimately happened was it brought up the long polling system, 
And later on down here, I was like, hi, well, the server just said it has a, it has a web sockets capability. So I'm going to attempt to connect to that. Then it opened the web socket, it received its verification token, and the web socket was successfully negotiated, and it killed the comment channel. So it was no longer making any more HTTP requests to the server. That was what happened, and that was why I was so confused earlier, because all those messages were coming across an open web socket channel, which is actually ridiculously more, ridiculously more efficient than using uh, HTTP long polling. Uh, but the cool thing is, is that Arise, Arai supports moving between these two technologies transparently. So even if you're in a browser that doesn't support WebSockets, or for whatever reason uh, you can't offer WebSockets through your firewall or some craziness, um, uh, Arai can actually work just as well using long polling. Of course, it takes more bandwidth, and it's, 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 not, it's not theoretically as fast, uh, but that's what was happening. Does anyone not know what WebSockets are? Because I, I actually asked, at a conference uh, called GIDS in India earlier this year. I, I went and had this whole spiel, and then someone put up their question and asked me what WebSockets were, and then I, of course, said, you know, okay, the question was, what are WebSockets? And I asked the audience, I was like, Does, how many people in here know what WebSockets are? And no one put up their hands. And I, and I had felt like I was an idiot, like just talking about this for like the last five minutes. So, so everyone knows what WebSockets are, right? Okay, good, good. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's like, you know, that's like the main demo part of my talk. I, I've been talking now for one hour and 15 minutes. Are there any, any more questions? Any more questions? Yeah. It's possible to inject um, a, a bin from the client side, a bin has been defined on the server side and vice versa? No. Uh, you cannot inject a bean from the server to the client or from the client to the server. Now, what we have thought of doing, uh, which is, would be allowing you to inject beans from a provider on the server or vice versa, which would, in theory, could work the same way as events do, uh, but, uh, I mean, there's the problem, the problem with doing that, like literally just comes down to um, kind of a chicken and the egg problem, right? Like the bean manager has like, life, like, a, like a life cycle management. And you know, as it's building up a bean graph, it's gotta get each of these beans into a ready state before it files the post construct and things like that. So if you're injecting a, uh, a bean from a remote server and that request is asynchronous, Right? There's no way to like, guarantee that the bean will be in a consistent state when it begins the actual life cycle of the bean and puts it into, into production. So there's really like, there's, there's, there's some real uh, you know, comp sci problems there in trying to do that, although it sounds in theory like it would be cool, but we can't really do synchronous I.O. with the server to stop it either, because we do synchronous I.O. JavaScript engines are single threaded, they work in an event loop, that means that the whole application has to freeze, including the UI, while we wait for that bean to come back across. And that doesn't create for like a very good experience. So that's not really the, that's not really possible right now. Any other questions? Yeah, you and then Abram right after. Yeah, well, how, what about testing? Te um, so uh, he, he um, uh, Sammy's uh, uh, touched on testing in the last. Uh, in the last talk. Now, how many here are familiar with Archelian? Archelian? We had a talk. We had a talk at Archelian? So, Christian <laughs> Sadlik, uh, who was another member of the URI team, who was also in Toronto, but originally from Vienna, Austria, funnily enough, um, is, or has been working on bringing Archelian uh, into the client uh, using. Uh, using GWT and Arai, so you can actually write Archelian tests for Arai in the client side in the same way that you write container side tests on the server. I don't have that actually set up and working here, and I don't want to spend the next five minutes doing that, but um, if you're, I, I can actually show you, because I guess I guess because you guys uh, didn't, that was only mentioned in the last talk, I can just show you a unit test here. Like, this is not a problem. I can just go to uh, if I go to, uh, let me see here. Um, 
cyclic dependency tests. I know there's a cyclic dex integration test. So this is this is this is this is actually J this is actually a J unit test. Um, looks like standard it looks like standard J unit uh, for the most part, and it is. Uh, but this is actually a test which gets compiled down to JavaScript and run in JavaScript. <coughs> Uh, so this is actually this is so, so we translate this test class with the GWT compiler and then run it. And so this this is actually uh, this this extends uh, abstract or ICDI test, which extends GWT test, and GWT test extends test case, and it provides the actual uh, uh, the bootstrapping to to actually compile the test down to JavaScript. And so we can actually we can actually run these run these unit tests, you know, using like a, you know HTML HTML unit. Uh, which it actually uses the HTML unit under the covers uh, after compiling down to JavaScript, and then it gets communicated back to, to the JUnit runner. But yeah, so these 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 are all client side tests uh, that are run in, in, in JUnit. You can see here we, we support cyclical dependencies, and so you can see we're inter interacting with our B manager here, and it gets two beans, and then it's confirming that these that this cycle was completed. And we can go ahead and we can run this test. And so it's so right now it's it's taking so long to run because it's compiling the unit test down to JavaScript code. Um, but if actually you run them, it, it, it doesn't have to do this for every test. Like if I run them all at once, uh, actually, that you'll see here, um, it runs quite fast actually once it's once it's got the once it's gone through the actual compile process. So these are all the client side CDI tests. So it's compiling it down to JavaScript. You can see that it's launched a, uh, a, an application server, so it's doing client to server tests. And so this is all running in JavaScript and talking to a server, and it's it, and it's being backed, you know, by this split test case. Um, but these these are these are client to server tests, full round trips going on, and in some cases they're the event routing and stuff. So it's actually quite easy to write unit tests in 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 GWT, GWT uh, with the rock and, and with Rock. and with Archelian support coming, uh, the ability to write Archelian tests will be 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 able to get the boilerplate for tests down even. Because you'll be able to inject beans directly into into JUnit classes. You can't do that now, but you'll be able to do that with uh, with uh, the Archelian support, and that will that will that will be even cooler. <coughs> and any other questions? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. He was next. I'll come to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you said the way to use Bootstrapita uh, as a UI, but Bootstrapita has its own uh, JavaScript yep. based on jQuery. Yes, so um, let's take a look. Uh, if I go over here, um, where is, actually, let me go back to that. Let me bring up my Project Explorer here. It's so big, I'm not used to. Um, the welcome page. Um, so you can see that we're actually, this is a little bit crazy. The reason, the reason for this is actually is just because you wouldn't do this in a regular application. They're like that in our demos because of it's really like because of the Maven and the Quit plugin. We need to get that fixed, so it has to like deal with relative pathing. Uh, but you wouldn't normally see that in a regular Array app that you yourself were building. You would just use regular uh, relative paths from the, your app, from your root. But um, we're actually using you know Bootstrap and CSS uh, here uh, with and. We're all, like you know we're we're also and we're able to do that because we can actually wrap Java around JavaScript. In fact, if I go um, here just to my app here, I'll show, I'll, I'll write a JSMI method. I'll I'll show you. I mean, um, <coughs> if I go here and create public static native void uh, some JavaScript, J, uh, JavaScript method. I can do, I can even pass in a string, like what, like, you know, if I go, like so, oops, what am I doing? Uh, yes. <sighs> Wrong, no. Uh, uh, so tough. Like so. Now, if you actually, wait, no, this is, um, yes, yes, that's, that's how you do it, all right. No, what am I? What am I doing wrong here? How do I? It's supposed to be. Yeah. 
there's a there's a there's a if I go to if I actually go to a class that I know has this construct here. Um, no, that is right. I don't know why my I, I did it right. My my uh, ID is not picking up. Oh. What what is it? Dash goes after the brace. After the brace, dash, and. Oh, the end. The end. That's why. What? Is that how I have it? No, I think it's just like. So no, you're going to have a beginning brace, but the end is wrong. Yeah. After closing brace, you write a dash. There we go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So yeah, so now you can see that my ID, because it's quite aware, realizes this is JSNI method. And so I can actually like write regular JavaScript code here. So I can like go like you know like fu like you know uh, f equals like function uh, s you know and uh, um, return s plus s and do crazy things like pass s to this function and return from this function actual return <coughs> you know. So like so like that's that's actually a JavaScript method now. I'm actually passing I'm I'm, I'm passing a, a, a string into it and, and defining a defining a function and then passing something to that function. <laughs> and if I go back up to my post construct here and if I I can, I can go ahead and call that function. I can go like uh, uh, window dot alert some JavaScript function blah and. Uh, value of, I think it returns a string. I don't remember the JavaScript coercion rules, but if we start this up now, you'll see um, that part. Oop. It's very, very mad at me that I'm not on the internet for some reason. Why does it want me to be authenticated to this? It's for a local the Wi-Fi off. I don't know why it's trying to reach out to the internet. I don't know the Wi-Fi is off, it's okay. But there you go, you see I, I, I appended that string together twice in a JavaScript function. And you so, in, a, in a context, you can use uh, Moodle? Yeah, I could, I, could, I could call jQuery from there. I, 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 could, I could call uh, jQuery within that, within that method. So I can, yes, I can actually wrap around existing JavaScript libraries using JSNI. So uh, that's, that's how, you know, that's, that's actually how a lot of like the actual GWT libraries itself, like, you know, like hash map and, uh, you know, you saw system.currentTimeMillies earlier, and it, that's really just gonna be like a JSNI function, which, which wraps the actual native JavaScript code, uh, JavaScript code. Which is, you know, one of the secrets as to how Twit is just like so fast and stuff, right? Because it's just, it's just basically creating uh, API translations around, you know, native existing stuff in the browser where, where it exists. Is that, that answer your question? Thank you. You had a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you showed how you can broadcast events to clients. Yeah. I'm guessing that you can broadcast them to multiple clients at the same time. So, um, yes. So you can, we, so with, for CDI events, we have two choices. This will change with multi-tenancy, which is coming uh, in CDI uh, in some, hopefully at some point. Um, but right now you can create a conversational event which will only go between one client and the server. So when I say conversational, I mean, um, I fire, an, I fire a initiation event and you send an event back and those events are conversational, which means they're tied to the same session. No other user will observe they, they, this this conversation, this observing of the event, uh, and that, that that uses thread isolation uh, to do that right now, uh, which isn't ideal. You can also create broadcast events, non-conversational events that all that all clients will receive, um, and that's really efficient. Like we use a uh, we use a, a giant ring buffer system in our iBus to. Uh, make it really efficient to deliver um, many, many messages to many, many clients really efficiently. But the third option, of course, would be to be able to have fine-grained control uh, over which clients you want to receive certain things. 
Now we can't do that with CDI events. You can do it with Array though. Uh, Array bus actually has a nice lower level API which allows you to do multi-tenancy. It uses it's a fluent API, so you can manually build up event. You can manually build up events and add uh, add like client IDs and say I want these four client IDs to, to receive this event and no one else. Um, and you can you can do that. It's it's in our documentation. So when you go and look at the Arrive bus documentation, we have that. It's not CDI though, because we can't represent that concept in CDI because it's just the programming model has no concept of multi-tenancy. I've been you know me and Pete Muir have been talking about this for like a while. Like how how can you represent something like this with CDI events? We have some ideas, and we're going to see if we can get that into like a future version of the spec, probably CDI 2.0. But uh, right now we can't represent it that way. But like I said, you're not you're not you're not screwed uh, if, if that's what you want to do. We actually have a demo. We have a chat demo in our Arrive bus uh, that that basically does this. It supports private messages. Like one user can address another user, and then it, it ties it all together. But it, it, it's a slightly lower level API. It's not a hard to use API. It's surprisingly easy for the task. But yeah, we can't do that with CDI events, unfortunately. Any other questions? Quick question. Um, you just mentioned being able to talk privately from one client to another. So does it mean that with AI you can also talk directly to a client without going through the server? No. No. Uh, well, because it's just not possible. That would be a ridiculously uh, insecure thing to allow browsers to do. Um, if you could allow a browser to, to directly address another IP address or something, you'd probably have lots and lots of uh, attacks <laughs> that um, So no, you always do have to go through the server. Uh, and, uh, and we have, like I said, we have a, uh, we have a, an actual section to our, our docs on creating relay services to do to do client to client, peer to peer communication via the server. Um, but yeah, I mean, either, I, I, there's no, currently no way, I mean, that's a, that's, good, that's a browser limitation. And probably a good one when you actually think of the security of Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Yeah. I saw that you mentioned you wrote a, yeah, an option for DBoss 7. So, should you make compilation? There's no compilation differences for different application servers. Yeah, so uh, what the minus, what the profile did was it, it was just for some applications, like for some things like Jetty, if you use the Jetty profile, uh, we include Weld, for example, to provide the CDI container because uh, it's not part of Jetty. Uh, or, or, or if you're just using Tomcat, you have to provide Weld. If you're using like JBoss AS7, Weld's built in, right? Because it's part of Java E6 to have CDI. So we don't provide those jars. So the profiles are just basically different packaging options for different app servers. <coughs> but the actual awry part, like the JavaScript and stuff is identical, no matter what, what server you deploy it on. Well, thanks a lot.